My name's Dave Treat. I lead Accenture's blockchain business, so I'm, I'm the guy, whoever asked that question, who is, uh, who's going to try to explain blockchain in a short amount of time. Um, I, uh, uh, we've been at this for, for multiple years now, and part, one of our major areas of focus is supply chain. Um, really, for many of the reasons that, that Jasmine, in, uh, what she talked about what Gooder's doing and, and what Ed talked about to talk, you know, to, uh, just, just before this, they raised some of the fantastic use cases around the auditability, the ability to pay people in, in new, interesting, and different ways, the ability to have that transparency to redirect goods. I thought that was just fantastic, and Jasmine and Ed, I want to work with you. <laughs> so, um, but uh, for how many blockchain experts are in the room? Excellent. <laughs> So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes and try to demystify it a little bit and just talk about fundamentally what is it. Uh, because it is a big change in the world of technology uh, and the world of really uh, business models. It is less about a technology widget. It is more about a business model change. And the way this business model change looks is today, and arguably for the past 50 or 60 years since databases were invented, we've been living in this world where I couldn't possibly trust your data and you couldn't possibly trust mine. And so we live in this back and forth of messaging to say, did you get it? Did I send it? Was it, you know, you know how many bushels? You know, is it, how, how long was it in the sun? You know, the back and forths of, think of all the questions that we ask, every member in the end-to-end -end supply chain for food, it's all messaging. And the, the lack of chore choreography, that lack of transparency, that lack of ability is all what has been, I, I would argue, one of the primary root causes of our challenge around getting a hold of the full end-to-end -end supply chain and being able to not have uh, the 40% food wastage, the 27% of the landfills. Jasmine, I'm not going to remember all your numbers, but the, you know, this, is, this, is the, this is the prize. So that was the that's the world we live in today. What blockchain technology is basically enabling us to live in a world where I'm confident that I see what you see. If I'm confident that I see what you see, I don't have to send you a message. I don't have to wait for a reply. I don't have to try to reconcile that. I don't have to work with that data. We're working off of a shared view of the world, and it all flips around if we're all confident in an ecosystem that I see what you see. That is what blockchain technology is ultimately unlocking. Now, you'll read in the papers and the media a lot of hype around, you know, that most of what you'll read in the media is about uh, the movement of value. Um, but there's another more fundamental use case, which is just simple access to shared information, right? Uh, if I go to my, if I go, if I get injured, I go to my primary care physician, a radiologist, a specialist, and the pharmacist, and I definitely end up talking to my insurance company to pay the bill, I would like them all just to have the same information that I see what you see is so is valuable in these multiple industry contexts. Um, there are four things that are generating this confidence in this system. The four characteristics of what blockchain is all about really boil down to the first thing is the provenance. And, and Jasmine spoke about this, that provenance between the, you know, the person with the excess food and being able to trace and say exactly where it gets to and where it's used. Well, think of that provenance all the way back to when something is pulled out of the earth and having every bit of the handoffs, every bit of, the, you know, of that end-to-end -end food supply chain, having the ability to have that entire provenance of data uh, available to you. So any data element that's introduced into a blockchain-based data system implicitly carries with it its full provenance. Now, the provenance we've had in, in traditional data systems for some time, the trouble is we live in a world of copy and paste, so you can't really trust it. And that's where the second aspect comes in, which is implicit in the math, and this is where the, a lot of the complexity, and you can, you, can, you can do multiple PhDs on this part of it around the complexity of, of how this works, but the math basically says any one of us with the rights to see into it can prove that no one's tampered with the data. 
So now I have a complete, for any piece of data or information that's introduced into a blockchain system, I can see its entire history as to who put it there for the first time, everything that's happened to it, who's read it, who's done what with it, and I know no one has tampered with it. The third piece is control. It's a control element where you're able to, in a traditional data sense, we've always talked about control at a database level or a data table level or a row level. We have a very blunt approach to how we manage our information. It's kind of all or nothing. Um, the overused but uh, easy to, uh, to relate to analogy is uh, I go, you know, I, my gray hair gives me away, but if I, you know, I go to a bar and someone cards me, I show them my license. They have no need to see my height, my weight, my home address. They just need to know that I'm over 21. That analogy is basically how we've worked in the business world for a long time, is we share, we share too much. We're not in, we don't have that individual data element control. Um, blockchain enables that. Each individual data element can be uh, controlled as to who should have access to what piece of information. So in the end-to-end -end supply chain, there are things that we all would benefit from knowing, and there are things that are pri proprietary or private and need to be secure, and we have that ability with a blockchain-based system to say, I'd like you to see this piece of data only, and the rest of us can see everything, and you can see just this piece, and that segregation and specificity of the data is very powerful. And then wrapped into that, the security aspect of this. Again, to create the confidence to get into these shared data systems, the security is also baked into the individual data elements. This is akin to if we created an Excel workbook, uh, today data systems l work largely the same way as if you password protected an Excel workbook. If I guess your password, I'm getting every row and column. I get the entire cell set of information. You see this in any of the major hacks or breaches um, that have happened over the past number of years. The first question that's asked is, how much did they get? Right? Because once you're through that barrier, you by and large have access to everything therein. A blockchain-based data system protects each individual data element uh, with a layer of security and encryption. So it's much more secure, much harder to break into. So when you put these three things together, the difference between a traditional data system that underpins how we all try to, to manage the end-to-end -end process in the supply chain or financial services or, or the like, when you put these things together, for the information that's in these systems that we're trying to work with, we know exactly where it came from, we know exactly who put it there, we know exactly what's happened to that piece of information along the way, we can see all of its permutations, we know no one's messed with it, we've got very granular level control over who can see what and who can do what, and it's more secure. That's the excitement, is that we can finally get out of the world that we live in today, which is based on siloed, redundant, duplicate pieces of information, this left-hand side of this picture, where we've got, we, we can't trust each other, and we message back and forth, and we waste a ton of time and effort and energy. How's that? All right, I'm seeing, <laughs> excellent. So, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's obviously gets very complex when you get into the technology, but that's how it works. So let's just talk about the value for food chain. Um, from a value perspective, again, Jasmine and Ed both did great jobs at, at talking about aspects of this. If we just talk about that, the, the quality, the behaviors that we all are trying to incent and reward at the beginning of supply chains, um, whether, you know, whether it's you know, don't, don't cut down the rainforest or uh, even slave labor, child labor, uh, you know, using the right materials, organic, not or, you know, et cetera. Um, that ability to have that full provenance of information all the way through and to have that certainty that no one's tampered with it and to have that auto ability and transparency is enormously powerful. And p companies just like um, you've heard today are thinking up creative ways to, to apply that to these kinds of challenges. Um, what's in my food? Is, is, my, you know, is, is my fish actually fish, et cetera? Um, the headaches that we go through when there's an issue, right? So classically, you know, today in a traditional data infrastructure using traditional methods, it is a weak minimum generally, to figure out what farm did that spinach come from. You know, people, you know, serious issues, people dying, our inability to know the source of the goods that we are consuming uh, and to be able to know who touched it along the way, these are big issues, and it is a mess of traversing redundant data silos and messaging to try to figure it out. Well, if all of that data is just implicitly captured along the way and available with the right entitlements and access, suddenly we can turn that week-long or worse effort into seconds because the data is just there. Um, I think Ed made a fantastic point, though, of there's a huge last mile problem of this, and, and I don't want to portray blockchain as a panacea for, for any of this. It is just a sol one solution component for that particular part of the problem, of course, the, the, 
the, um, the, connect, the connectivity, that last mile connectivity to the device, to the farmer who may not, you know, maybe in a rural setting may not be connected to, uh, to the internet, may, ha may not have de devices, that last mile challenge is, is material. And so I, I don't want to portray this as a panacea, but it's a it's really interesting enabler of key parts of the process. Um, on the efficiency side, this is just basics, right? The, when, you, when we talk, you know, when I, um, I, I met with a head of one of the world's largest ports recently and we we're talking through kind of the dynamics of how much visibility do they have into the future as to what, you know, how they can then do the choreography of the ship comes into the port and then the right combination of trains, trucks, trailers to be ready to take the stuff off the ship. And the complaint was, look, we've got about two days visibility. And that's not enough time to line up the right trucks, and that's what causes something to sit. Well, as many of you can appreciate, food sitting outside of the cold chain, at, you know, in the worst case scenario, you know, in the hot sun in a port, you know, is disastrous, right? So the ability to choreograph and get that forward view as to what's going to happen and get the, the, the coordinated set of players together to predict the next action um, is crucial. Um, so, you know, across these end-to-end -end players, you know, we're very focused on forming a community in a very open way of all of the partners who have a stake in different pieces of this end-to-end of this -end ecosystem and change what we've been doing for years, which is I'm just going to try to work better with the person one, one or two nodes upstream of me or one or two nodes downstream of me. And instead, if we're able to link together all the way back to the small rural farmer and all the way through to the high-end grocery store, an entire ecosystem to be able to show uh, that provenance of data, improve the level of services, minimize the handoffs, strip out the messaging, we think that we can uh, you know, all collectively uh, as, as an industry work to really you know, change that nature of that food wastage, change the messaging, et cetera. Um, I'm running low on time and I wanted to make sure I left time out for questions. So I'm gonna stop here. Let me go to Twitter first. Or not, we can go to the room first. Any questions about what I said? Please. I can repeat it if you shout. Yeah, it's um, it's one. Enormous, and if this is adopted worldwide, yeah. So it's um, it's uh, it's one of it's one of the most f more fun misconceptions, actually. Um, so uh, the question was about the energy consumption in blockchain. Um, and I'll try to do this very, very quickly. The, the energy consumption problem is where you have a public, public permissionless structure, where they had to come up with an incentive mechanism for someone to provide the compute power. And so for Bitcoin or Ether, we, there, the, it was a really creative, hugely innovative approach to say, let's, in, let's, let's incent the public to go out and buy hardware and servers to compete to, to add the compute power to run this system. And in return, we'll reward them with Bitcoin or Ether. Well, the, the, the effect of that is if I buy more hardware than you do, um, I have a better chance. And if she buys more hardware than, than I do, she has a better chance. And so we've had this massive arms race of then vastly more compute power being applied than necessary. In a corporate and enterprise construct, stitching together the players that we would need to stitch together from a supply chain perspective, we don't have that concern of trying to incent the public to provide the compute power. We know exactly who's going to provide the compute power, right? The, you know, the likes of the freight forwarders, the shippers, the, the, you know, the distributors, the, the ecosystem will you know, do it for itself. And in which case, it's vastly more, it's, it's, well, sorry, it's vastly efficient, and we're finding even, you know, more efficient than even running mainframe processes in some instances. So um, it's not a concern for this context. For the public permissionless space, yeah, it's bad. Authorizing and authenticating uh, people accessing the information or inputting the information that's accepted across all platforms. Um, if there's not one, do you see that eventually somewhere in the future that will be accepted? And also encryption, um, when we, is there a common platform, you talk about all the way down to the data elements in everybody's different systems, is there a common accepted platform across all these systems that's gonna be commonly accepted? Uh, you, the two deep questions. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to answer them cursorily, and then I can go into more depth afterwards. But identity is at the heart of, blo of, of blockchain and distributed ledger. 
the whole notion of shared access to data is, well, who are you sharing it with? And to your point, who's putting that piece of data in? So identity is at the heart of this, and there are, there's, there are a number of groups who are fo we're working on that standard for changing the notion of our identity infrastructure to work with things like this. You can actually look, we just published a paper last week with the World Economic Forum around what good digital identity works with, and that is a core component of how this plays out. So if you read the paper, it would be my first suggestion. Um, your second question was around the standards and the platforms that are emerging. Um, there are two, two things. Yes, there are, there, there are, at this point, there's a proliferation of, of blockchain-based platforms out there. there. There are really a top set that are getting serious use in a production setting in a corporate and enterprise environment, and those are, you know, um, and so there, there is the consolidation coming around core platforms. There will not be one to rule them all. Um, I can guarantee it. Uh, and then on that same uh, step, there's a huge focus now on setting those standards so that there's interoperability between those platforms so that they can all work as a networked ecosystem. And I'm out of time, but I, I'm happy to go into more depth, but identity's key and standards are key. So thank you very much, appreciate the time, happy to take questions. Later. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to those fantastic speakers, and thanks for being a great audience today. I'm the very last thing between you and lunch and departures, so I wanted to share with you, just before we go, our foundation's manifesto, which, here we go. It's something we wrote for ourselves a couple of years ago, and it's sort of like our Pledge of Allegiance to business and business solutions and innovators and creators. And if you look closely here at this bottom line, we really mean that when we put these programs together, that for what's new and what's next, we're really all in this together. NGOs and businesses and civil society and government. It's really going to take multi-stakeholder solutions. And I know many of you come from those groups and we thank you for joining with us today. I hope that wherever you go in your work over the next year until the next Food Forward that we do, you'll consider us a friend and a resource. So one last request of you before you go today is if you could take a look at the survey sheets that you've got. We really do pay attention to these, and it would mean a lot to us if you could give us a few thoughts on what you thought today about um, our speakers and the programs and what you might like to see us do in the future. So thank you again to all of our speakers. Thank you to Kroger and Dow and the Food Marketing Institute for helping make this program possible. And I know that, let's put our hands together and join me for thanking the great foundation team who put this whole thing together. Um, Hillary, Hillary Crow is fantastic. She does one program after another like this. Greg Kundolf is our good partner. So thank you to all of you. Um, so now listen, we've got a quick reception that will happen at the back here. And if you had pre-registered for one of the deep dive sessions, those are going to start right at 12.30 sharp. Um, we've got signage outside and folks that can help you get to where you need to be. So thank you, and until next year, thanks again.